Hello everybody, now today we're going to have a look at Afternoons by Philip Larkin, taken from the Educas Anthology for GCSE English Literature. Now, this is quite a challenging poem. It's a poem that links to the theme of transience, the passing of time, uh, and also touches on relationships. Now, it's a challenging poem because it doesn't really offer us any clear-cut meanings or, or resolutions. It's certainly not a poem that offers us much hope for the future, and it's quite subtle and nuanced in its meaning. Essentially, this is an observational poem um, that depicts the very kind of mundane, ordinary aspects of life, and it depicts the very monotonous and restricted lives of young mothers and their children, and to some extent their partners too. It describes quite routine chores such as laundry and very ordinary objects such as televisions. And this observational um, type of poetry that was based on very ordinary aspects of life was something that Philip Larkin was very much known for as a poet. The poem ends uh, by showing that the women's lives have somehow changed. It says that their beauty has thickened and that they are no longer fully in control of their own lives and their own trajectory. And the poem also ends with a very strong implication that the next generation, their children, will follow this same cycle, this same pattern, this same routine. So this is very much a poem that is about the monotony and cyclical nature of life. And as I mentioned already, it clearly links to the themes of transience, the passing of time, and also relationships. Now, before I talk about um, Larkin as a poet himself, if you look at these images on this slide here, these images give us a glimpse into some of the things that we, uh, some of the themes and ideas that this, this poem touches upon. So the idea of um, new housing being built, which was very much prevalent in the 50s and 60s, new estates, um, the idea of domesticity, of, of, of chores, and also touches upon the very distinct, clear gender roles that were around at the time. The men working in uh, manual labour and the, and the women expected to live a life in the home and to look after the children. Now, before I do actually move on to, to looking at Larkin himself, there is a bit of context that you do need to know about 1960s Britain. So this is where the, the poem was published in 1964 as part of the collection called The Wits and Weddings. Now, obviously, the 1960s was very much a different society to the one we experience now. Gender roles were much more defined. Women were expected to dedicate themselves to, to raising children and looking after the home, living a life of domesticity while men were typically expected to be the breadwinners, have a job and provide for the family. And also in the 60s, um, this is the time when we really saw the government take steps to renew old housing and create new housing developments with, with green spaces. If you can imagine um, housing blocks that typically sometimes had a park and a playground in the middle. This is that image that I want you to think about um, as we read this poem. And so it begins. Summer is fading. The leaves fall in ones and twos from trees bordering the new recreation ground. In the hollows of afternoons, young mothers assemble at swing and sandpit, setting free their children. Now I will return to this opening line in a second. But we immediately get this image of economic growth and change inserted into the poem. Now, the building of a new play area. A recreation ground simply means a playground or a park, and it's new. Now, this implies immediately a sense of change, but as we'll see in the poem, the routine of these mothers simply stays the same. So it's somewhat ironic here. The idea of recreation um, is also a spontaneous one, that play should be something free and spontaneous, but this is a very purpose-built park that's built for a specific reason. There is a clearly defined border to their place of play. In the hollows of the afternoons, young mothers assemble. Now, this word hollows is quite a striking word, uh, word choice. It means a, simply an empty space, a vacant area. It means a hole of some sort. And really, this implies that much of what 
they occupy their lives with is quite empty, quite hollow and quite meaningless. It suggests boredom rather than an opportunity for play and excitement. And the fact that this happens not in one afternoon, but in multiple afternoons, there is a plural here, again strongly implicates this idea of routine and monotony. Young mothers assemble at swing and sandpit, setting free their children. Now, the women in this poem are only referred to as mothers, implying this quite restrictive role of gender stereotypes, even from a very, very young age. It's quite, um, it's quite striking that the mothers here are young, that they are trapped within this role at a very early stage. And they assemble. Now, an assembly simply means to gather together for a common purpose. That there are these groups of mother, mothers rather, who are there assembled at this park, all for a common purpose. All having the same routine. To simply let their, children's play, uh, let their children play and get some momentary respite. So here, the children enjoy a freedom seemingly enjoy a freedom that their young mothers no longer have. And we see here this sort of language of imprisonment, setting free. Um, and what we see here is a, a quite clear contrast, at least at the start, between the lives of the, of the children and the lives of the mothers, which is seen to be very restrictive and very monotonous. Now, this opening line, Summer is Fading... And this obviously links to the to the title of the poem, the idea of afternoons also signifies the passing of time. Now, this obviously implies a change of season, symbolising perhaps a change in life. Is this about how life and youth is now fading along with the seasons? Is this a link to the ageing process? We'll, we'll return to that idea later. Now, one thing that this poem does quite subtly is explore what we call boundaries and thresholds, liminal spaces. Summer is fading, so it's not yet autumn, but it's almost. This line is quite um, conjures up quite a few different possible meanings, but again, it always links back to that idea of the passing of time and perhaps the idea that their life and certainly the mother's youth the, the youth of the mothers is now fading they become they're becoming hardened by the monotony and repetition of their lives behind them at intervals stand husbands in skilled trades an estate full of washing and the albums lettered our wedding lying near the television now here we see the women, again, lacking any real sense of individuality. At the start, they're just called young mothers, and now they are referred to as them. There is a anonymity to them. There is no individualistic, uh, individual characteristics coming out of them. And here we get a caesura, a, a, a kind of pause within the line that is there to signify the separation between the women and their husbands, the societal expectations between the role of the woman and the role of the man. And the men typically are working in skilled trades. Again, linking to the idea of, of, of gender roles and gender conventions. So we've got this idea of the skilled trades being contrasted to this very domestic image of an estate full of washing. Now, this is quite clever because... Uh, Larkin here has essentially coined his new, uh, a new noun, uh, this estate full of washing, alluding to the routine chores of washing, that all the groups from the estate on the housing estate are all similar. All the women are having to do the washing, that it becomes almost an estateful. So this noun here, this newly coined word, estateful, highlights, again, the monotony and the fact that Everybody is uh, is lead is living this very cyclical, uh, repetitive life of chores. And the albums lettered "Our Wedding" lying near the television. Now, here we see this sort of momentary spark of love mentioned about the wedding, but notice how the title of this is italicized. 
it's almost quite patronising. It's almost like everybody has an album called Our Wedding. This title seems really personalised. Whose wedding? It's ours. But here, it seems that everybody has one. The italicised title here is, is, is almost used in quotes to makes the speaker quite, sound quite patronising. And the irony is that as personalised as this title is, we can imagine that it's quite universal, that everybody has, a, has an R wedding uh, photo album. And even this, this symbol of love and relationship, uh, the symbol of love and successful relationships is left discarded, lying near the television. So their love has become something quite ordinary and neglected. And remember again what I said about Larkin as a poet, his focus and fixation on ordinary objects and ordinary uh, aspects of life, that their love has just been essentially reduced to uh, a decoration piece that's just left near the TV. Before them, the wind is ruining their courting places. Now here, we get this implication that, uh, by the way, courting means like dating, relationships. So places where they used to meet up and date. The wind is ruining their courting places. This suggests that the opportunity for love is being taken away and that nature, nature and, the, and the passing of time is somehow working against them. So returning to this line about the estate full of washing, this is really um, a key quotation really to remember for your exams uh, with regards to this poem. It makes their lives seem identical. Not just one mother's lives, uh, one mother's life, but eh, all the mothers that live on this estate. Okay, um, Since they all live in similar estate houses with no individuality, the idea of an estate full of washing makes it sound monotonous and a tedious life of domesticity. So a real key quote to remember there for your exams. We also get within this stanza a clear binary opposite, a contrast between behind them and before them. If we just zoom back here we've got behind them are the husbands but before them in the past presumably the wind has ruined their old courting places. Now, these two phrases highlight the separation between the, the women and their previous identities as lovers in these courting places. And the fact that their husbands are, are standing behind them also shows the se separation of genders and their expected roles. Remember, the men working in skilled trades while the mothers are there tending to their children and, and uh, watching them play on the recreation ground. Now moving on to the final stanza. I'll just give it a read through and then we'll unpick some aspects of it. There are still courting places, but the lovers are all in school. And their children, so intent on finding more unripe acorns, expect to be taken home. Now what we see in this stanza are several references to youth. We are told that the young lovers are still in school. Either that or they're at the playground picking unripe acorns. Now, these images of youth contrast quite heavily to the idea of summer fading and the passing of time. Now, the key thing about this final stanza is the idea of life being cyclical, of things and patterns being repeated. We get a strong implication here that the, the young mother's children will soon follow a similar pattern to the lives of their parents. We see this in the repetition and enjambment over both of these stanzas of the idea of the courting places. It shows that their lives will follow the same pattern and the fact that we are told that actually these, these lovers that will soon take their parents' place are currently in school. It's almost as if their trajectory, their lives are mapped out before them, this life of monotony and repetitiveness. Something, it's quite ironic, isn't it, that something we would normally associate with being um, a sort of life accomplishment of family and uh, finding a partner, is reduced to something quite monotonous and quite tedious. Now, obviously, this links to Larkin's life 
um, as he was quite a solitary man. He never married, never went abroad. More on that later. Um, but yeah, he almost subverts what would normally be a quite uh, a quite happy image. It's the same with the with the with the wedding album that he somewhat satirizes. And their children, so intent on finding more unripe acorns, expect to be taken home. Now, this line, in a way, has somewhat of a dual meaning. It shows that the children, too, when they've been dropped off at the park to play, are also restricted by routine. They expect to be dropped off and then picked up, expect to be taken home, that they, too, live somewhat a monotonous life. And it also implies that the children themselves contribute to their mother's restricted lives, that they have to then do the washing for the kids, that they then have to drop them off at the park at a specific time. So even the children here are almost seen as signs of restriction and limitation. And as I mentioned here, as it says on the right-hand side, the new lovers are currently in school, which could suggest that they are soon going to take their parents' place. Their beauty has thickened. Something is pushing them to the side of their own lives. Now, this is where we get quite ambiguous and unclear. Larkin is saying that the beauty of the young mothers has thickened over time. Now, this is the only end-stopped, standalone sentence that we get in this poem, which gives it a degree of emphasis. And there is also a change in tense here. Something has thickened them, and something is pushing them to the side of their own lives. Now, here, Larkin could be inferring that the beauty of the women has faded over time, that they've become aged, and that their beauty has been lost due to this life of monotony, and uh, this life of experience, really, and, and the, obviously the passing of time. But even more ambiguous is this is this final sentence. Something is pushing them to the side of their own lives. Now, we are immediately left to question what, what this could be. It's unnamed and comes across as something quite fret, uh, threatening uh, and quite ominous. Perhaps Larkin here is alluding to their domestic life, their, their, their domestic lives, the the ageing process, or perhaps time itself, is pushing them away from the life that they used to have, um, that they are losing control of their own trajectory and losing control of their own path in life. Now, like the tone of this poem, it's very much ambiguous. It's not very clear. What you can say about this, if you're writing about this poem in an exam, is that ambiguous tone and the, the threatening and ominous nature of this line. We can speculate that, that Larkin could be referring to um, the life of domesticity pushing them to the side of their own lives, almost absorbing them as people. And we see throughout this poem, don't we, a lack of individuality all throughout. Remember that image of the estate full of washing. Remember the, the satirised title of the wedding album, Our Wedding. Uh, and remember, the, the mothers are simply described as young mothers. We don't get a description of any of them, other than the fact that all of their beauty has thickened. So, thinking about Larkin's use of imagery here, as I've mentioned, we see lots of domestic imagery within this poem. And, they're used, and it's used to highlight and reinforce the gender roles and the gender conventions within the poem. They also highlight the routine and repetitive nature uh, of, 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 of the women's chores and their existence as a whole. And really, the, one of the more striking points in this is that even their spark of love is lost over time. Something positive, like having children, raising a family, finding a partner, is something that's lost over time and becomes something ordinary. It's reduced to, remember, this wedding album that is left lying near the television. Larkin also uses natural imagery within this poem, uh, and it's supposed to there mirror the change in people's lives. The, the, the passing of time that eventually... We all become detached from who we really are through through the somewhat restrictive aspects of society. 
The poem's title, remember, Afternoons, and the arrival of autumn suggests a new phase in their lives and that the best part, the youthful, um, exuberant, enthusiastic parts of their lives is over. And the way that the wind ruins their courting places makes it appear that both nature and time is working against them. And I think really the, the, the aspect of this, this poem that offers the least optimism and the most cynicism is the idea, the, the implication that their children will soon be replacing them in this cycle. So, thinking about the form of the poem, it's three stanzas of eight lines, so there is some degree of regularity here, but there is no regular rhyme scheme or metre. Uh, and this makes the poem appear quite stilted, and this suggests a lack of excitement in the mother's lives. It kind of mirrors that lack of excitement. There is a tension throughout the poem between the kind of irregular and the regular aspects of the poem, and I suppose um, this is also shown within the themes of the poem that certain things are expected, but then it's never really truly until you grow old that you reflect on perhaps some of those more positive aspects of life that have now departed. And as I mentioned, the tone of this poem is very ambiguous, it's very unclear. Um, the speaker in part seems to be belittling the women by mentioning about their beauty being thickened. Uh, is he mocking them and their and their the wedding album and their life of chores? Or is he pitying them? Mentioning the ambiguity of tone would be really important when writing about this poem. So finishing off with some context then, as I mentioned before, there are references to economic growth within this poem. New estates being built, the husbands being employed in skilled trades, and it's, and also the reference to the TV. Um, it's important to note that TV ownership grew rapidly in the late 50s and the, and the 60s. As I mentioned before as well, Larkin's poetry is very observational, and it explores the ordinary, mundane events that occur in people's lives, and this is certainly something that we see reflected in this poem. Now, former poet laureate Andrew Motion um, described Larkin's poetry quite brilliantly as having a very English glum accuracy about places and relationships. Now, it's often been said that there is a very British English cynicism about Larkin's poetry, uh, and a short quotation like that would be an excellent contextual point to include in your essays. Now, Larkin himself led a very restricted life. He never married, he never travelled abroad, and he worked as a librarian for 30 years in Hull. And his kind of literary personality, really, was one of a, a solitary Englishman who hated fame and notoriety. Now, this is quite fitting, isn't it, in the way that we think about this poem and the way that it almost satirises, and some would say mocks, events that we would normally view as quite uh, associated with accomplishment and happiness. So getting married, um, finding a partner, having children. Rather than celebrating these events, this poem kind of critiques the way in which they can lead us into a life of monotony and repetitiveness and a life of restriction. So I hope some of these points have helped you and uh, good luck in the rest of your studying.